Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 167, I'm going to talk about why vinyl sounds way better than digital. That's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be. Hang on. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, now this isn't meant to be a hand grenade of a topic. So just hold tight and I'll explain what I'm thinking. Now, this topic was pretty much forced onto me because for weeks now, I've been watching videos from everyone explaining why digital is superior to vinyl. And at some point, I just couldn't take it anymore. You should have listened to him grumbling. <laughs> Was I as bad as Grandpa? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> no, nobody's as bad as Grandpa. So consider this an official rebuttal to all the BS out there. Okay, so let's follow the signal chain and see if we can figure out what happens to our signal from its birth in the studio to our source material at home. So everything in the studio basically is analog. When a vocalist sings into the microphone, that's an analog signal. What comes out of the microphone, that's an analog signal. Now it becomes an electrical analog signal, it's, but it's analog, right? Same when you strub on a, an acoustic guitar. If you had, let's say, an electric guitar with an electric pickup, same thing. It's still an analog signal at this point. Still converting vibrations into an electrical signal. Right, exactly. So let's take the traditional path in a recording studio. We have a nice big professional reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. In between here we would have a mixing board, but there's not enough room on my little work table to get everything in. So, so it gets it, it'll get lightly processed, it'll get recorded on tape, and it'll go to a mixing and mastering stage. And pardon my sketch here of the patch bay. It, it's not, it, it's really hard to tell, but basically this is where all of the, um, the inputs and outputs get patched so that you can organize your console. Um, and um, at this stage, we're in the analog domain. We're in the analog domain here. I should have put some analog little signal. Th these are representational sine waves, yeah? Actual music as they would appear on an oscilloscope, or commonly called a scope. Yeah, if you have a pure frequency being generated. It's often much messier than that because you'll have multiple frequencies. Yeah, this would be something like, let's say, 40 hertz. So, um, uh, maybe a little higher than that. Maybe <laughs> 60 hertz. <laughs> Anyways, all right, we digress. So, we're analog here on tape. Uh, we're analog here in the mastering stage. And from there, I actually drew these cards backwards. But from, from here, we can basically cut a record or we can make a duplicate of the tape. We're still in the analog domain. From there, we need to go into a preamp because there is EQ applied. To make it fit on that media properly. Right. Yeah. And this happens for tape, not just for vinyl. That's right. And there's there's a couple of formats for tape, but they all basically do the same thing. Um, and there's some noise suppression uh, formats for tape as well. Not for vinyl, though. That's that's what the EQ is all about. But we've, we've already gone over this in previous videos. We're still in the analog domain here, whether we're on vinyl or tape. In the phono preamp, even though we have to shift the EQ back, to flat. It's still analog. It's still analog and from there we'll go into our home system and what are our speakers? They're analog. When the uh, signal goes positive, here's a positive signal, the speaker cone pushes out and it disturbs the air molecules in front and it sound sends a it sends a, a pressure wave. A pressure wave. wave or sound wave however you want to talk about it. Uh, to your ears and your ears pick it up 
and your ears are analog. <laughs> so I think though the interface from the eardrum to the brain is back to is it analog electrical at that point? I guess so. Huh? Well, it's it's nerves, so it must be electrical. Yeah, but is it analog or is it digital? It's not digital, <laughs> so it's got to be analog. I don't know. Are we analog or digital? That's a good question. Well, I think it's organic analog. <laughs> Maybe. Anyways. Okay, so let's go back to the same studio, the same singer, the same guitarist, the same music, the same equipment. What happens today in a studio? Well, that signal is going to go through an analog to digital converter, an ADC, or in sh short, they're typically called A to Ds. And that signal is going to be stored on a hard drive somewhere. As bits. As bits. So it's a digital approximation of that original analog sound wave. Well, let's be fair. Let's call it a very close approximation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and when you're mixing and mastering that, it's going to be done on a computer console, and it's going to be done in the digital domain entirely. And in fact, if you do something simple like change the volume, you actually do that mathematically. Yep. And you're going to have a virtual uh, mixing console, and you're going to have all kinds of plugins. So, over in the analog domain, if you traditionally, if you wanted reverb, you'd actually have a reverb room set up with a speaker and a microphone and a room that had the acoustics you wanted or you'd be recording in a, a hall of some kind that had a natural acoustic reverb or you know in the case of instrument amps you might have a reverb tank that the signal passes through that's right later on we ended up with uh, plate reverbs and um, and all kinds of technology but we're trying to sort of talk about the purest form of analog. Mm -hmm. But over here, you do that reverb would be done in the digital domain, and you do it with a plug-in. And in fact, virtually any effects that you want it would be done uh, with a plug-in. So from there, we can produce digital media. So we can produce a CD or the higher quality version of it called the SACD, a DVD, a Blu-ray. Um, a file on a hard drive. Yep, and most of many people will be just streaming. Um, but no matter how you look at it, it's it's still uh, still bits. Yep. And from there, we've got to go back to analog, and we do that with a digital to analog converter, typically called a DAC. So we go from the bits. And we arrive at the other end of our DAC, we come out as an analog signal. And this, if this was the same studio and essentially the same processing, should be a very close analog. Get that? Very mm -hmm. close analog? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. To our analog signal. And they should sound the same in our listening room if we have the same equipment at the same volume, but they don't. Not only do they not sound the same, but they are really, really different. The digital signal, no matter how good the ADC conversion is and the DAC is, tend to sound very neutral, very low noise, very clean, uh, modern recordings uh, through no lack of the technology tend to sound very flat because they're compressed heavily. They don't have to be that way. They can be dynamic. But most recordings out there are compressed. Are compressed. Yeah. Heavily compressed, unfortunately. But even very good uh, high quality red book, that's the uh, essentially the industry standard for a high quality CD, so that just means a CD that's been mastered properly <laughs> to industry specs. Um, uh, or an SACD, which is DSD, um, which is, in my view is a better form of uh, digital uh, processing. Um, or high res, um, 19296 files. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to matter. There's a... There's a a lack of... It seems like something is lost. Something is lost. It's 
it's hard to see that music as being lively, musical, enjoyable. Um, it's just, to me, when I compare it to digital, it, it sounds flat. Mm -hmm. Now, on the analog side, um, there are an incredible number of bad analog recordings, just like there are an incredible number of digital bad recordings and and even more bad mastering jobs done on on the digital side. Yeah, well, every every one of these stages matters in both cases, and it will affect the sound in all of the cases too. So you can have a badly done analog recording. So for uh, our discussion purposes, let's presume that we had a good and uh, mastering engineer over here and a good mastering engineer over here, the same tunes, and everybody is trying to do the best they can. The analog side will sound a lot more alive. It'll have um, a sense of a live performance. So probably at some stage, most likely at the cartridge stage on your turntable, we're getting some we're getting some uh, harmonic distortion added to the signal. Mm -hmm. Tubes do the same thing, uh, and in fact, these days a lot of studios will run the signal through a tube buffer simply to pick up those lovely live feeling acoustic um, distortions. Add some of the warmth back in. Some of that. Tube Add sound. some of the warmth back in. Now I attend an awful lot of live performances that are acoustic every year in great sounding music venues. So I have a really good sense for what a live analog performance should sound like. And to my ears, the vinyl records come closest. In fact, with the recent upgrading that we did to our system, uh, that included uh, a new tube phono preamp, a uh, new cartridge, other upgrades in the vinyl side. Our vinyl system sounds so much better than our upgraded digital system. Well, we, yeah, we've been upgrading both. We've uh, uh, set up two new digital DACs, and uh, while they've sounded better, they still haven't compared to the vinyl system. So, what's going on? Well, I think... I think a big part of the problem is that when we go from analog to digital and we go back, we've got distortions that are inherent to the digital domain. And I've been recently doing some uh, prototype work and, and bench work as well as studying on the digital side because I feel that maybe, just maybe, we can do something on the digital side um, and uh, build something in-house. And one of the first things one of my big texts talks about is all of the inherent distortions on the digital side. All the errors that are introduced. Yeah. yeah. So I think that is a big part of the problem. I think the other part of the problem is that uh, whenever you come out of the analog domain and you go into the digital domain, you, um, y you, you've lost a certain kind of a linearity to the signal. Hmm. that you just can't get back there's you know you you if you put in a bunch of errors at this point a bunch of errors at this point and a bunch of errors when you bring the signal back um, there's no way to fix that and I think what is happening is our ears are sensitive enough to what is a good analog sound everybody knows what analog sounds like because if you're chatting with your your friend in in the in the in the kitchen um, you've got probably decent acoustics. We're lucky. We have a house that's got really lively acoustics. Mm -hmm. so, so you know what the sound of a good voice sounds like. If somebody, Charles, whistles a tune, you know, I'll be playing something during dinner hour. And the next thing I know, he's doing dishes and he's whistling the tune. <laughs> and his whistling is lovely. Uh, and it sounds fantastic. But I bet you if we converted that to a digital signal and then brought it back to analog, I don't think it would sound as good or as natural. Probably sound harsh, yeah. Let's take a look at some records that might just help us understand a little bit more about what I'm talking about. Now, I couldn't stack these up because these are all treasures. So here is an original first U.S. press of one of the most famous jazz albums ever made, Kind of Blue, 
And this was all done in the analog domain, of course. It was recorded in 1958 and released in 59, or was it all in 59? I forget. Um, I've actually got a book on just on the recording of it, which is fascinating. Um, it was recorded in two sessions, and they actually goofed up. Uh, probably they adjusted one of the tape machines for uh, another recording and then forgot to reset it, but maybe it was just a maintenance issue. Anyways, it was decades later that some fan um, timed the piece and realized that the machine wasn't running uh, at its correct speed. Anyways, I think it was running a little bit fast, wasn't it? Yeah, just it's just a tiny little bit fast, but he proved that uh, <laughs> we had all gotten used to the tune just a little bit faster. <laughs> and as you speed up the tape speed, uh, you shift the, the uh, frequency response upward, I believe. Uh, and that's, of course, how in the old days they could shift uh, somebody who was singing off key, they could actually shift their voice. Yeah. Well, uh, if you've ever heard sped up audio of people talking, they sound like chipmunks. Yeah, there exactly. You know. <laughs> so you, yeah, so you go up and of course you slow down, you go down. Um, anyways, um, this sounds fantastic. And the, uh, SACD version of this comes fairly close, but it doesn't come that close. So, and that's the best version I've ever heard is the uh, remastered SACD version in the digital domain. Um, what's next? Oh. Ah. Okay, so in between the CD, which came out around 1982, and I was there uh, anxiously waiting the release of the CD, Hang on, I'm kicking over kind of blue, which would be a really bad thing. That is an expensive record. Um, what happened with the, with the record companies is they actually started pressing digitally recorded um, uh, records and featuring it all over the labels and their jackets. They would put big write-ups inside on promo cards and stuff like that, talking about the benefits of digital. These very early digital records, they were all made from about 1980 to 84, 85. They sound amazing. Mm -hmm. They don't have the inherent problems of later digital records, which I'll show you in a minute. These have a very low noise floor. They have an incredible dynamic range and uh, clarity that is unrivaled um, in either the digital or earlier analog domain. It's kind of the best of both worlds, really. Yeah, and these records uh, sell for nothing. Nobody wants them. Okay, now, at the very end of the analog era, there was a new technology developed for cutting records, and that was called DMM, or or direct metal mastering. And in this technology, um, the cutting lathe actually cut um, the metal part and skipped, I think, two stages. Normally you would cut a lacquer, which is soft. This gives you better high frequency response, better definition, and, um, and you've got to be careful though, because if you're not used to really clear bright high frequencies, this can get irritating. So on some systems that have never been exposed to that kind of high frequency reproduction, it's tough to get used to. So mm. metal tweeters, metal dome tweeters, you won't like DMM pressings. Um, but on our system, we have a large soft dome and a waveguide, and that tweeter handles the DMM pressings nicely. These are fabulous. Um, and quite a few of these were, were made uh, under the Telarc um, label, and these are actually, Errato actually did some too, I guess. Anyways, a lot of European and some North American records pressed in the, uh, in that late 70s, I think, early 80s, and DMM is still around. There's still two uh, machines, I think, left in the world operating. <laughs> Isn't that they, they At the end of the vinyl era, they scrapped them all. Yeah. So... And they stopped developing the technology. And because it was relatively new, uh, there weren't a lot of machines around. 
So, anyways, um, this is one of my favorite world jazz composers, musicians, groups. Anwar Braham is just out of this world wonderful. He's on ECM. There's the plug. Great, great jazz label. They also do um, world music and really have specialized in Euro jazz. And um, this is fabulous acoustic music. And um, the, the digital records suck. Well, mm -hmm. th they don't totally suck. It's not like a giant pile of suck. Yeah. It's just a small pile of suck. It's like having a bad digital recording. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's, it's a little bit better than a bad CD. Yeah. Um, but the, because, and the reason for that is simple. This was recorded digitally. It was always envisioned as a digital file that would be a CD or eventually later on stream. Now, when this was recorded, they probably were thinking about everything. CDs, SA CDs, uh, streaming, you name it. Mm -hmm. But they were not thinking about vinyl. And actually, ECM had to go back and start rethinking about taking releases that had never been released as vinyl records and fitting them onto records. Um, and I, moving forward, I guess they have to think about that. But a lot of time restrictions in the, uh, in the analog domain don't exist in the digital domain. I mean, people don't want records that are 12 hours long. <laughs> and obviously, you're not, you don't want to record a 12-hour record. But if you know, you're restricted to 20 minutes aside on a vinyl record and you know, a piece digitally naturally lands at 25, well... <sighs> you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble in the, in, the, in the analog domain, but you're not in trouble in the digital domain, right? You would make a 25-minute yeah. aside record. Yeah. So, anyways, the, these are a great disappointment, and this is not unusual. And almost, if you go into any new record store today and buy a record off the shelf, it is almost certainly mastered from a digital file, even if it was originally an analog tape. Yeah, if it's a, a new, uh, new pressing, new release of something, it was probably taken from whatever the best analog or digital version of that file they had available. Or not even. Not even, yeah. yeah. Whatever they had available. Now, if it's new music, there's a very good chance that um, it was conceived as, as ECM conceived it, as always going to be in the digital domain. Mm -hmm. Avoid those records at all costs. Avoid those remastered records that were taken from digital files. Avoid buying digital music that's been pressed into vinyl. You'll never be happy with that. You'll be much better off with a good quality uh, mastering on a CD or just streaming it. Yeah, I mean it's going through all the all the same steps Just earlier you have to go back through an eight through a DAC and then put on to a, uh, a vinyl disc Here's another example same thing. This is on 2L and this is an absolutely fabulous um, Scandinavian record label the music is glorious they do digital like you wouldn't it's it's like being in heaven and listening to angels sing there's clarity uh it's some of the best recorded digital music i've ever heard um and they've won all kinds of awards for for the recordings but pressed on a record it, it's not a it's not a total suck but it, it mostly oh, is we're losing our focus here oh we're going <laughs> That's because our camera does it doesn't have anything to focus on. I'll give it the finger. There we ah! go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, so traditional records like Kind of Blue and millions of other records like this that were recorded in analog and pressed in analog, that, that is going to be the music that you will want to listen to in analog. If it was always meant to be a digital recording and it's music you really like. It's probably going to sound best as the digital file. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, did we really answer why we think analog is superior on a whole over digital? Well, I think so. I think if all other things are equal, if you have a, a well done recording and you have good mixing and mastering done, 
the errors that are introduced on the digital side just don't sound nice, where the errors that are introduced on the analog side can actually add to the sound a little bit, or at least not detract from it as much. Yeah, maybe. And what's the big anomaly that we've got? Well, the big anomaly, and we don't want to make this video too long, but here is the big anomaly. Yeah, those early digital recordings. So how can these sound so good, so much better than CDs, so much better than um, hard drive streaming, Yeah. Than, and even sound, to my ears, even a, sm a small improvement over traditional analog records. And we don't know. We've been theorizing about it, but you know, if there's some uh, old recording engineer out there that worked on something like this, we'd love to hear from you if well, you have an answer. Well, we've got a couple of theories. Mm -hmm. And one of them is that the very early um, uh, a, a to, to, to D converters. Analog to digital. Analog yeah. to digital. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> um, that they were extremely well built and in fact weren't even chips because chips just mimic the circuitry that um, just miniaturize the circuitry. Mm -hmm. And I was, just, I was supposing today that Philips and Sony that developed this technology Together, but independently. They didn't actually have their labs working together with each other. In fact, they were competing at the same time that they were agreeing on formats. Um, and they were backstabbing along the way. So, mm -hmm. And there's some good stories that I've learned as I study the digital stuff. But um, the, I suspect that the engineers who built the first analog to digital converters um, and then the, the first DACs to convert back we're building really high quality point-to-point uh, -point or um, just component-based systems that mm -hmm. were using the absolute best tolerances they could find, the best components. And that may be part of the reason why. I mean, that's part of the reason why our kits sound so amazing is that... Short signal paths, short as few components as possible to get the job done. Carefully chosen components when we have to put a component in the signal path. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be one of the secrets. Charles thinks that they're actually bullshitting and then in fact they were in the analog domain it might have been maybe uh since a re digital recording was a big selling point at the time just like switching over to transistors from from tubes they may have just used it as a selling feature i, I mean uh obviously uh with tubes everybody was lying about everything where they were coming from so who knows about the recordings yeah who knows okay well Hopefully that answers more questions than it makes. <laughs> we'll have to see. We'd love to hear what people think about it, though. Now, we're going to reset the table, and thanks to Charles's editing, we'll come back. We actually have some really beautiful tubes to take a look at, so hang on a second. Oh, and you know, I forgot something that I also was thinking about. You know, the all of those digital recordings that I was showing um, and that are in my collection all have their source back at the Philips technology. Um, at, in the very early days of digital recording in Europe, Philips partnered with a bunch of uh, the record labels that were um, w that were trying to get into digital and um, the very first DACs that were produced by Philips and Sony the Philips DACs um, today, many of the early DACs are considered to be exceptional by audiophiles. So and they're still being used. They're still being used. So it's possible that that early simple DAC technology um, just contributed to the quality of that sound. So, um, yeah, anyways. All right, so what came in? Um, well, first, before we get into these tubes, we have absolutely massive numbers of beautiful tubes that are on their way right now and I can't wait to show them all off to you. Um, we also emptied the bank account. Yeah, we emptied the bank account but we got lucky finding some great stuff and actually these are representative of, of some of the things that we've had coming in. These are both early Sylvania GTAs. We have the early straight plate version. This is a 6SN7 GTA. Let's see if I can focus that in. That's the back-to-back -back straight plates. And we have the next version afterwards, which is the angle plate version of the same tube, but they've curved those two plates out on, I think, a 90 degree angle from each other. 
Anyway, so these are some of our favorite Success N7 tubes, and we've been finding, uh, surprisingly, a decent number of new old stock and good used versions of them. And, I mean, these are just, they're fantastic sounding, they look great. The full rich Sonics. And these are tubes from the 1950s. Um, can you imagine? We've got tubes that are um, 70, about 70 years old. Um, that are we're still able to find that are either brand new or uh, lightly used. And we probably mostly have organs to thank for that because organs, traditional organs, tube organs, were filled with tubes. And they were either filled with 6S N7s or 12 A's. Yeah, later on. And, you know, if we were lucky enough to have an organ that was barely used, then uh, the tube should be in pretty good condition when they come out of it. Or it was retubed at some point in the 50s and then <laughs> put in storage. <laughs> and then put in storage. Because tubes don't deteriorate unless you stick it in um, a solitaire environment and really corrode the heck out of the pins. Yeah. Um, that vacuum keeps the, the electrics uh, in near perfect condition. I don't know, have we ever seen a tube actually deteriorate inside the envelope? I don't think so. I mean, the, if it loses its vacuum, of course, yeah. it's going to happen. But if the vacuum is maintained, if the vacuum is maintained, and many of these earlier tubes have so much gettering on them to capture uh, stray uh, gas molecules that they they're just in excellent condition nowadays. Well, thanks for showing those to us, Charles. And if you stay this long, we've got some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we can reach almost everybody around the world with a flat rate shipping of $20. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. And people have been figuring out the easy to figure out secret code and costing us big bunny. And that is just fine. I really like to see customers grabbing and viewers grabbing discounts. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.